Many years ago, I worked for the Texas Conference. It was 1981 or so, and I uh, was working in the Fort Worth First Church, and uh, everything was going along swimmingly, and I had found a young lady named Mary Ellen that I was dating, and I was very happy about that. And the Texas Conference moved me to Houston, just to make things more challenging, I suppose. And I'm living in Houston, and uh, in those days, intern pastors got moved a lot. And I just lived in fear and dread that the next move would be to the Rio Grande Valley. Because the four and a half, five and a half hours from Houston, I could make and continue to try to keep up that dating relationship, but uh, 10 hours from the valley would be really, really hard to do. Well, one thing led to another. I decided to go to law school. I uh, was gone and practicing and, and, uh, for 25 years, and, and then I was at a point that uh, I was pretty burned out, and, and we were reconsidering ministry again, and, and uh, Gary Brady called. He said, we'd like to invite you back into the ministry. We have a problem that we'd like you to work with in the Rio Grande Valley. And so we prayed about it. And it was hard to mistake that it was a, an invitation to return at the same place that we had left off before. And we, after praying about it, we accepted. And he said, never mind, I got the valley fixed. We have a place in Dallas. Today we study the account of Jesus sending his disciples into the field for the first time. Mark chapter 6 and verse 7. And he called the twelve and started dispatching them two by two. In Greek, that word is simply duo duo or two two. So it was an idiom that meant two by two, but it was just two two. Ellen White says, Calling the twelve about him, Jesus bade them go two and two through the towns and villages. None were sent forth alone, but brother was associated with brother, friend with friend. Thus they could help and encourage each other, counseling and praying together, each one's strength supplementing the other's weakness. It was the Savior's purpose that the messengers of the gospel should be associated in this way in our own time evangelistic work would be far more successful if this example were more closely followed. What do these dynamic duos have that individuals don't? Number one, in the, in the, in the Hebrew culture, it was really important because the scripture in the Old Testament said that every testimony or every witness, every, uh, uh, everything that's spoken needs to be confirmed by a second voice in agreement and if it's confirmed by a second voice then it's plausible and believable so sending people two by two gave them a witness to join with them it also provided as sister white suggested mutual love and encouragement it is not good for man to be alone were some of the first words that we read in genesis it provides a partner for ministry interesting do you have a prayer partner do you have somebody in your life that you are comfortable praying with? It's a really interesting and important question. You know, prayer is an opportunity for us to speak to God, but it's always an oppor- almost always an opportunity for us to speak with God, to God with somebody else as well. Do you have anybody on earth that you're comfortable praying with? If you don't, I urge you to consider whether or not that's a practice that you might want to open up and begin in your life. Next, it tempers individual excesses. Have you ever noticed? Maybe you're not like me. Sometimes I have really poor ideas. And it's really good to have a partner who can tell you, Man, that's really a poor idea. I know it seemed good to you when you were thinking about it, but that's just a bad idea. And hopefully I provide that same check to others. It provides accountability. Not only do people sometimes have bad ideas, some people also do things that they wish they hadn't done. And sometimes we can glaze those over, and so accountability comes from multiple people and multiple voices 
um, twice the ideas and the synergy. It provides multiple perspectives to the hearers. It provides multiple personality styles. You know that one of the things about having a big church, I know that, that we talk a lot about church planting. And I've been in large churches and I've been in small churches. I once pastored a church with uh, frequently less than 15 people in attendance. I understand small churches and I understand the benefit of the intimacy of that group. I also understand that in a large church, uh, you know, my personality may be for some people an acquired taste. And it's good, it's good to have a church that has multiple pastors. So if you're not comfortable coming to me for whatever reason, if you're not comfortable with my style for whatever reason, we have other people. Travis and uh, Rick and Tony, all are people who are different from me and they provide multiple personalities and styles. And the other thing is when you put people two by two, you just get twice, at least twice the productivity. He says, he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. That's an interesting opportunity. How do you give somebody authority? Is that possible? Can you give somebody else authority? I remember the first time that my mother drove me to a store and said, I'll wait in the car. Here's the credit card. I said, but they're going to request a signature. And she said, you have my permission to sign my name. She gave me authority to use her credit card. Now, that was pretty exciting. These days with debit cards, I guess we have numbers instead of signatures. But that was tremendously exciting. I had my mother's credit card. I had authority to spend real money, not play money, not the money that I had, not the little money that I had, but the money that she had. How very, very exciting. In fact, it's very interesting to me that there's a whole area of the law associated with this. It's called agency law. We can be agents of another and have all the authority of the other. And for, in fact, what's really interesting is we can create liability for the other. Luke 10, verse 18 says, Yes, he told them, this is Jesus, I saw Satan fall like heaven, from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over the power of the enemy. You can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. And then he goes on to say, Don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Trying to keep their priorities straight. But he's given them authority. Now, in fact... The whole essence of our theology of substitutionary sacrifice is really about authority, isn't it? It's about agency. Jesus died in our place. That's agency law all over again. In fact, he died in our place, and right before he did, he said, when you pray to the Father, I'm going to tell you how to pray. I want you to ask for what you want in my name agency again he's giving us the authority to ask for things from the father as if we were jesus now there's another kind of authority that i got to caution you about this is an important important part of authority for years we fought about this in the law can you have authority where authority is not due or responsible or owing? And the answer is yet. It always came up, yes, it always came up in the context of physicians. Back in the old days, hospitals couldn't employ physicians in Texas. Physicians had to be a part of their own association, and then the hospitals contracted with physicians to come in and treat patients. But every patient thought that the doctor was working for the hospital because they came to the emergency room and here's the emergency room doctor taking care of them. They presume he worked for the hospital. So the question was, could the doctor's liability be imputed to the hospital? And it was a question that went on over and over and the answer ultimately became yes. And here is the problem with that. We as a church also give substitutionary or what we called apparent or ostensible authority. Paul says, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. But as the scriptures say, you must remove an evil person from among you. He was talking about a person who was doing things that he said, quote, even the Gentiles don't do, that was bringing reproach on the name of Jesus. When we are calling ourselves Christian, we are assuming 
ostensible or apparent authority for God's church. And we need to watch out what we do so that we do not bring reproach on the name of Jesus. We need to act right. And when we act wrong, which is inevitable, we need to apologize not just to God, but to the other people who see it. He ordered them to take nothing on the road except a staff, no bread, no luggage, no pennies in their pocket, but strapping on sandals and don't wear two shirts, he said. What is all that about? Later, we know that he came back and he said, when I sent you out to preach the good news and you did not have money, traveler's bag, or an extra pair of sandals, did you need anything? No, they replied. But now, he said, take your money and your traveler's bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. In other words, this is not the final word in evangelism. This is a trial run. This is a testing run. This is to show them that when they go out to do the work of evangelism, they are to do it in total, complete, utter reliance on the Father. Not to take anything with them that would ever lead them to believe that something they did accomplished God's work. They were to go with nothing in hand. In fact, that is an interesting saying, pennies in the pocket. Apparently, they didn't necessarily carry wallets in those days, but they wore a cloth sash around their waist. And that cloth sash, like a gentleman's cummerbund, had little places in it. And they would stick little coins. And so the idiom that he uses for pennies in the pocket was the smallest copper coin stuffed in that sash. So coins in the sash is what it was called. And it was referring to a little inexpensive copper coin. And so it's exactly, I think, straight with pennies in your pocket. Not a penny in your pocket. God prepares those he sends. The training of the disciples... The example of the Savior's, in the training of the disciples, the example of the Savior's life was far more effective than any mere doctrinal instruction. Now, the disciples had been with Jesus. They'd been traveling with Jesus. He'd already been to all the villages in Galilee. He had preached to them. He had healed their sick. And it says in this book that all the people from all the surrounding areas had come to hear him preach at Capernaum as well. So he had been all around. God prepares not only you, but God prepares the field for you. And God will provide for your needs. Don't go in your own strength. It's okay to be weak. Paul has a long discourse on this. We don't have time for it this morning. But you might want to read that. He says, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. Now, I recommend they did not travel first class. So if you see an evangelist, no, I'm not going to say that. Now, the other question is, he told him, don't take two shirts. Why not take two shirts? Uh, This shirt that he's talking about is typically an undershirt. Don't take two shirts means don't get ready for luggage and all that you're going to need because you need to rely on God to take care of you. That's not necessarily a permanent instruction, but it was an instruction for them, and it was instruction to show them that God really was supporting their travel. It also was an instruction that they were to be simple in their approach and presentation, simple in all they did. But the last thing he says, but carry a staff. Why would they carry a staff? Lots of Old Testament stuff about carrying a staff. I won't go into it all, but there was Aaron's staff that budded. Each of the 12 tribes had a staff. A staff is a symbol of authority, and Jesus is sending him with his authority. The scripture goes on, and he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Why would he say that? Number one, I think we need to understand that they knew people in all of these towns. He had already had a lot of people flocking to Capernaum. He'd gone to these villages. He'd healed people. They already had contacts in these towns. So very likely, they were going to a place of a person that they knew, and they were going to stay there. He says, then don't go moving from house to house. Now, why would you do that? Well, you'd do that First, not to be a burden on the person you're staying with. And the second reason you do it is because you find somebody with a better house. And Jesus is saying, look, God is showing you 
absolute trustworthiness and fidelity in taking care of all of your needs, you need to show fidelity to the other people. You need to model that same fidelity of staying where you're invited until you leave the town. The flip side of reliance is trustworthiness. Any place that does not accept you or respond to you as you leave there, shake the dust from the bottom of your feet as a witness to them. Now, that means nothing to us. That's just weird. But in old Israel times, they had a ritual ceremony that whenever they traveled to Gentile countries outside of Israel, when they came back into Israel at the border, they would stop and dust off their feet so that they would demonstrate in ritual that they were not bringing the filth of the Gentiles, the filth of the rest of the world back into the Holy Land. And so they did that, and what Jesus was saying is, when you are rejected in a village, he's saying, keep in mind, that village is not any longer a part of Israel. True Israel will accept the progression of truth in Jesus preaching you know they'd had some progressions in truth before we went from Noah we went to Abraham we went to Moses all kinds of new things introduced under Moses all kinds of new things introduced throughout and then the 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 prophets came and, and introduced all sorts of ideas that they didn't already know and then along comes Jesus and he says big new shift in the nation of Israel it's time to either get on board or you're no longer part of the movement of Israel. Major questions that we ask, have to ask ourselves today. Do we have an understanding of what it means to be God's people and respond to what Ellen White talked about as new light, new truth? Are we Are we good with continuing to research the scriptures for newness or are we completely locked in in 1913? It's an important question. It's an important question that each of us in our hearts need to answer and it's an important question that our church needs to answer. And they left and preached, urging change. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many invalids and serving them. I know that's not the way that you usually see these scriptures, but I've retranslated them, and I think they're accurate. And he says, serving them. They were serving them. So, when we reach out, he says the first thing they did is we're to preach change. Satan's greatest success in our current culture is convincing people that they don't need to change distracting people from their own pain so that they feel content and satisfied. Back when I was a young adult, there was a book came out called I'm Okay, You're Okay. The premise of the book was, look, I'll give you a pass on your problems if you'll give me a pass on mine. We moved forward and we grew up with a whole generation of people that were in fully engaged in the self-esteem movement. The self-esteem movement says, you're great because, well, you're just great. Don't have have a reason to be great, you're just great. You're great, you get a trophy. Why do you get a trophy? Because today's trophy day. You're fantastic because you're fantastic. It's a, it's a completely godless meme that means nothing. God says you're great for one of two reasons. You're great because I created you great. And two, you're really great when you acknowledge that I created you great. And then number three, he says you're great because I'm good. I've got places for you to go, places to be greater. So we've come full circle almost. We've now gone past the self-esteem movement to a movement that I'm seeing in people these days where they say, man, I am really messed up. Aren't you proud of me? Have you, have you seen that ideology out there? All kinds of people that are saying, wow, I've got this and I've got that and I've got the other, and man, this is fantastic. The full circle of this deception of Satan, I believe, 
is when the gospel intrudes and says, yes, you are really messed up, and guess what? You don't have to be. God has a solution for the problem you're living with. Now, I don't know how that works exactly in a culture that's told them that being messed up is pretty cool. That being messed up is a badge of honor. But the gospel message is that the mess that you're in, I guess the question we have to ask is, how is it working for you? How is that mess working for you? How is it helping your relationship? How is it producing the outcomes that you want to produce? Is it good or is it not good? And the gospel comes in to make it good. There's the story recently that went viral about the town that had little potholes. I'm not going to say anything about our town. Town in, in Toronto had little potholes. And so people started planting tomatoes in the potholes. And I'm thinking, this is the world we live in. Don't try to fix the problem, right? Plant tomatoes in it. God has a solution. God comes. There's a good place to plant tomatoes. It's not in the street. There is a good place for us to go, and it's not to a place of brokenness. It's from the place of brokenness that God would have us. The message for a post-Christian culture is God can fix it. What's wrong with you, God can fix. It's a message to the lost of transformation, but I'll tell you, it's also a message to the church. The church of Laodicea is also transformation. A transformation of understanding. Now the next thing that it says is they went out and they were actually healing people and casting out demons. I believe that the message of evangelism is that we need to demonstrate the change. We need to show people what it's like to be God's people. If you don't have a testimony of change, you need to pray about that. I know I grew up in a very racist, judgmental, hard culture. I know that I had teachers who modeled racism. This is the 1960s. Most of you who are my age or older remember these days. That, that was considered perfectly culturally acceptable at that time. But God has given me a new heart. And now people who I originally would have seen as just different from me, I see as beautiful, whole people just like me because God made them just like me. We have so many examples of how we could be, how we could be, but the question is, are we? And then last but not least, I think that the disciples went out and they made themselves agents of change for the people. Sister White says, in Desire of Healing, during his ministry, Jesus devoted more time to healing the sick than to preaching. The followers of Christ are to labor as he did. We are to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and comfort the suffering and afflicted. We are to minister to the despairing and inspire hope in the hopeless. If you haven't read Desire of Ages chapter 37 lately, I encourage you to do so. We can supply change to others. We actually can be the change for others, either individually or corporately. We've been talking so much about what we'd like to do down at the annex. We'd like to have a food pantry. We'd like to have cooking classes. We'd like to have, we've talked this week about all of our pastors getting together and our lay people getting together with us and making a free wedding. People who are living together that need to get married that we'd offer them a free wedding down there. Music, guests, reception, minister, all that they might need for their, maybe even gifts. That people who need a wedding that we could provide that for free. We can provide change for people who don't even yet know that they need it. The scripture finishes with, the ambassadors reassembled with Jesus, and they told him everything they did and taught. And he said to them, you need to come to a place of solitude and rest for a little while. 
for there were crowds coming and going, and they had no time to eat. So they separated themselves in the boat to a place of solitude alone. Have you ever noticed, if you've had a pool, you've noticed this. If you've never had a pool, you may have noticed it anyway. Have, in, in the pool, we used to, when you have a pool, all your friends come over and all your family comes over for every holiday, okay? And so you go to the pool, and the pool, when all the kids are in it, is a tumultuous place to be. Don't try to lay on the little float and sunbathe when there are four children in the pool, right? It's going to be wavy. It's going to be choppy. It's going to be just like Jesus uh, woke up from his nap on the boat and the, and, the, and the water was everywhere. However, there is a period of time that it takes, and that period of time is finite. When the kids all get out to get something to eat, and the water settles to a place of perfect glassiness. And Jesus is telling his people, after you have done all these things, you need to return to a place of glassiness. These things are going to be exciting. They're going to be uproarious. They're going to change things. They're going to be exciting. But you have to return to a place of glassiness. So this scripture today, short scripture, has several important, but I'm going to give you three, and they all begin with R. Is that okay with you? When he sends people out, he asks them to rely on him. He asks them to reach those that he sends them to, and he asks them to come and refresh themselves. I don't know where you are in your journey right now today. It may be that the problem is you have never really relied on God to go out and to speak his truth and to help others. It may be that you've never actually, relying on God, reached out to others, and it may be that you've never really taken the moment to refresh and you're still in an uproarious experience. But these are the messages that Jesus sent to his disciples that we need to do those three things. So I'm going to pray for you now, and I want you to pray for whichever those three things God is calling you to reliance, reaching out, or rest. And I'm going to pray for you just now. Heavenly Father, there are those in this room who have never fully relied, and we ask for those who recognize that, that we'd like to rely just now, not on our funds, not on our family, not on anything else that we have generated or that has been given to us, but rely completely on you. We also ask that you would give us the opportunity and the courage to reach out to others in the way that you would have us to do. And last, we would ask that you give us rest. We thank you for the Sabbath, and we accept your gift of the Sabbath today. And we thank you that this is that day. Please give us rest today and give us a fresh start in reliance and in outreach tomorrow. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.